The Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored by Mid-Island Motorsports, located in Springdale, Newfoundland. www.edgeproinc.com By the Sea Inn and Cafe, located in Kings Point. And Outdoor Pros, located in Mount Pearl, Newfoundland. Good morning! It is a beautiful, crispy winter morning. We're up above the town of Burlington, Newfoundland. Heading in for breakfast with my buddy Ray. We went out, I think, early last year in the new year, right? And did uh, did an episode for the show. We're heading out again this morning. And we're gonna cook up a good breakfast. It is cold here. It was down around minus 15 last night. It's warming up a bit this morning, but uh, a snowstorm is on the way in, so I don't expect it to get too much brighter. We're off of the trail on snowshoes this morning. It's gonna be a good time. Look at that toasty fire. I haven't been too concerned with filming this morning because it is not very nice out. We're poked in here off the side of a bog here now and uh, we're a little bit worried about getting a fire going but we have a beautiful one here and out comes the cast iron right now. It's just, oh! Ah, woo! California going in with a pack of bacon first. What a way to start, start a year. Oh man, we gotta get this on the fire. Our bacon is cooked up, sitting aside. We have some beautiful moose sausages in the pan. And then when the sausages get done, the bacon's going back in with some beans here. <laughs> oh, come on up there, baby. So the storm is in full force out here. You can see the back of Ray's clothing there just from sitting and eating breakfast by the fire. I would bet that all of our tracks from the way in are probably snowed in. So we're heading home right now, or at least back to the workshop where we have to talk about a new project we're doing. Man, that breakfast went down good. Back to the shop and thank goodness it is a little nicer in here. Not a whole lot warmer because <laughs> there's no source of heat in my shop. But it is a lot uh, lot quieter and a lot less wind and no snow and, and rain beating down on me. So that is nice. What we're going to be doing today is very exciting and that is building a custom knife for me. Now you guys have seen me build lots of custom knives and I've made quite a few at this point. I've made a lot of people's... Uh, a lot of people's dreams come true in that sense so when, when they had something in mind that they really wanted to build they send me sketches and stuff and it's been a lot of fun getting to do that but I've never built a knife specifically for me if you've been watching the show for a while you may have seen me build a batch of knives that I called the Bake Apple a set of neck knives I believe there were six with juniper handles
very nice. I kept the one stamp number one for myself, and uh, that neck knife has been with me on all the adventure since. You know, that's the beautiful thing about having a real special heirloom quality knife, and that's that's something that I've held on to ever before I got into knife making, um, is having a tool, an axe, a knife, or something like that, that is that is with you, that is your knife, that is your axe. I love the idea of having a, a grandfather pass down his shotguns that has been on uh, too many hunts to count with him, or, or a knife that he's skinned uh, a dozen or two dozen moose with over decades of hunting. To me, that's so special to have, and uh, in my opinion, these new tools and, and stuff, just they're so expendable. It's like these Havilon uh, replaceable blade knives that, that hunters tend to gravitate towards these days. I get the utility of it. I get that it's nice. You're working on a moose. You just pop out a blade when it gets dull, pop another in. But it's the knife means nothing. It doesn't have any value. And uh, maybe you're someone that just doesn't care about that. But to me, that's really special. It's really important. And, uh, and I want to have a knife for myself that, that has that value. The Bake Apple has definitely played that role for me in the few years since I've had it. Adventure after adventure, it has been right there. I've used it for the cooking and the firecraft, and, and those memories are just building into that knife. And that knife now has a level of sentimentality that you just you can't get from a replaceable knife that you go through a couple times a year. I've definitely had my my cheaper, my uh, replaceable style knives, but now I try to keep with something that's of closer to heirloom quality that I can have for decades and uh, and maybe pass that to my kids one day. Little cool here, but uh, just, it was just that first run, number one. That's the goal today. I have made a few knives in the past that I've held on to and planned to keep for myself and then someone offers to buy it and I sell it right away because it's important for me to have uh, that source of income for my family. I choose to do without the knife and, uh, and take the cash. But today, today we're making something that's not going to be sold. This is exciting. Let me show you guys what I want to build. Now one of the true beauties of investing in a custom knife is that you get to have something built for you. Everyone has different styles in the woods. I know guys that, uh, that want real big beefy knives able to withstand anything uh, and they're doing real heavy work with it. The concept of bushcraft, which I've played around a little bit, is the whole art of kind of uh, building camps, building shelters and all this kind of stuff. And if you're doing a lot of that work, maybe you do want a big heavy beater knife that can go through anything. For me, the bulk of my knife use when I'm in the woods is, uh, is just firecraft. So getting some kindling, getting some birch, cut carving some feather sticks and different things like that. Along with that, food prep for cooking. I do a lot of food prep when I'm in the woods. Uh, you guys know I like to eat. And then of course when I'm eating my meal. 
So I don't want this big honka knife that's clumsy and that I can't use for that. So I want something right there, kind of on the smaller, lighter side. Something real classy because I'm not going to be beating it or thrashing it. It's, it, can be, it can be really beautiful. And, uh, and nice and compact and maneuverable. Now the design saw I'm using is actually quite traditional. I'm gonna build something that's called, uh, some people call it a puko, I think it's similar to a, a tommy knife some people call, and that is you have a nice straight back blade, very simple, nice long straight edge, probably around a four inch blade length or so, and then you cut into a reduced tang, now those guys that are really thrashing on their knives, they don't like this because you don't have that full tang here that we're used to doing because we're going to cut the steel into probably just a quarter inch or so here. So, But I don't need that toughness. So again, that's the beauty. I'm thinking we're going to do uh, a section of brass here, something like that. Maybe some other layered materials. And we're going to do a leather stacked handle, which is really cool. I've only done it once before, but your handle is built up of leather stacked like that. Another section of brass on the end. This is going to be peened out. I'm thinking of doing uh, a dual grind here something like this I'm not sure yet uh, we'll play with the finishes in the end but this is essentially what we're doing for the design the Newfoundland Hobbyist is sponsored by Paul's Finest .com. Nobles Timber Mart with locations in Springdale and Bayvert wildmedkits.ca Robinson's General Store located in Middle Arm and ABS Bussing also located in Middle Arm, Newfoundland. The steel choice is going to be that lovely old one bar sock that I like so much. You've seen me use it before, but I usually use 1 8 inch thick. This time, because I'm attempting that dual line, which means I'm going to put in the knife bevels, but then some, at some point in the blade, we're going to break and grind in, not to a, an edge for the tang, but grind into just probably a few mils thicker a little better. Kind of a swedge that runs all the way along the blade. Because I'm doing that, I want a thicker stock because I'm going to be milling away a lot of the material. I'm going to be using this 3 16 to uh, sort of save me from having a blade that's too weak or too light. One of the other beauties of having a custom knife is that the knife is built size-wise to your specs. So that is length as well. Having a knife handle that's too long can be dangerous because if you have all this excess hanging out in the back and get caught up in stuff and it can become clumsy when you're carving and things like that can just certain situations can arise. Uh, same thing with an axe. If you're using an axe handle that's far too long, uh, it's just, just not safe. So I get to measure now and get something that's tailored to me.
handle components will slip in over this tang here. We'll have a brass bolster that fits perfectly against this surface. We'll also have a brass bolster, I don't know if you can see that step right there, there's just the tiniest little step. A brass bolster will sit against there as well to contain everything on the handle. Now what I've decided to do, this is 3 16 thick steel. I have dimensioned it to 3 16 this way as well, just this little one inch step here. Now I'm going to break those corners, try to round it into a 3 16 cylinder. That way my, my end bolster, we can drill a 3 16 hole in the middle, slide it on, and peen over there. So that is the goal. It's different. It's something new for me. But I'm going to try that. Anytime you're trying to radius a flat like this, it's best to use a series of facets. So in order to keep this symmetrical, I'm best off trying to do 45s here on all four corners first and then break the 45s. Now here is the progress so far, and that is we have a uniform width tang, which looks very nice. So that that's, that can be a little bit tricky to get this all uniform width. You also, this is a tough part, you have to square up these faces with each other. Because there's a plate sliding down over here, like this, that has to mate to both surfaces. And if one protrudes farther than the other, obviously you're going to have a gap there. So that squared up as even as I can get. We can make a small micro adjustments later if we need to. But we've also made this into a 3 16 pin. Lots of measuring, lots of slow progress and checking. But we have a nice square mating surface here. And this is a 3 16 pin. So our brass our brass in here, brass pummel now, just became a lot easier because we'll just make a drill of 3 16 hole, slip it on, it'll be nice, nice, uh, and a round surface is easier to peen as well. So that'll work real nicely. The next step now is to grind in our bevels. I'm not sure yet. I'll see when I get going on the grinder if I'm going to do a convex main bevel or a flat grind. We'll see, maybe a convex, but the, the we've been talking about doing a dual grind or dual bevel. And that means there'll be some separation line right down along here. And then there'll be another grind tapered in on the back. So I'm freehanding the works of it, as I do with all my grinding. So we're hoping this will turn out nice and clean. We can always uh, blend everything together and just make it all, all uh, convex sort of state if we run into trouble. But... It's going to be a challenge for New Year, but we'll see if we can get that ground in properly. Have a look at that. You see what I was talking about? That dual bevel? Oh man. That is sharp. You see on the spine there, we have probably the thickness of a nickel. Between a nickel and a dime all the way along. This is finished up to a 600 grit belt here now. The flats are the original flats. but. I don't know if you can see, we really thinned out the profile. 
And that's why I didn't want to use that one eighth inch thick material because uh, you wouldn't have been able to feasibly do this. You would have been left with not enough steel, a little, little thin blade, not robust enough. But here now like this, right this center core here all the way down, we still have that real heavy 3 16 stock. So it's nice and thick there as you can see, but we do have a lot of weight removed and uh, just a beautifully elegant profile all the way along. My plan is, when we heat treat this, to leave a forge finish on the blade. I want it just to be all like kind of gnarly and black, that real black and finish that comes from the forge, except for just the micro bevel we'll put on for the edge. So an all black, all black rough finish, and that super like premium polished handle. It's going to be good. It's going to be good gonna stamp my initials in there now and we'll get on to heat treat. Now I just had an idea come to mind that I may be crazy for doing but I was just laying this blade down about to stamp my initials in there and for a long time I've been wanting to do some engraving and I've, I've always played around with a few sketches before but just never the right place never the right scenario and uh, I have an idea for an engraving on this blade right down that center portion I've sketched out a little, uh, a little bit of sort of, sort of vine work, I guess. There, that's what I want. Something a little bit tribally like that, right down the middle. And since I'm not polishing this blade, if I was polishing this blade or something, it might look a little bit too much, a little bit too tacky. But where I'm gonna plan on leaving it a black forge finish, a lot of it'll kind of blend in, and you'll just see kind of very faintly in through the black and through the darkness that vine work. So I'm actually gonna give this a try. I really hope I don't spoil this because those grind lines are so, so good. But uh, I'm going to get out the Dremel and give it a shot. Now I could probably use a better set of tooling. I have my uh, sort of budget Dremel here and I have just, you know, those little diamond grit bits that uh, the different shapes and stuff, different sizes that come with Dremel kits. I've got a set of those. I probably could, it, maybe if this turns out alright, maybe I'll invest in like a, a set of nice little engraving tools. But I was just thinking, you know, this, stuff like this is kind of how I've got into all of my hobbies and all of my projects and how I've had a lot of my success is just thinking up ideas like this and saying, why not try it? You know, I, I don't know if this will work. Maybe it'll, I'll, I'll end up making a blade that I don't like quite as much. But if I don't try it, I'll never know. And if I try it and it uh, and it works out, or even if it kind of 80% works out, I kind of like it, but it's a bit rough. It's just a, a new skill for me to work on. So hopefully, hopefully it'll turn out well, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> And that's what you get for taking your time and trying something new, not being too scared to give something a shot. Even if it seems a little bit silly or seems a little bit beyond your reach, like there's no way you get that to look good, give it a shot once in a while. And maybe, maybe you'll come out with something special. Maybe you'll learn a new skill. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I really hope you learned something in this episode. Hope it inspired you in some way. And if not, at minimum, I hope you're at least entertained. I'm really excited to be moving along with this blade project, and I want to encourage you guys one last time to give something a try. Give something new a try. When you start exploring, when you start taking risks, when you start reading into new things and, and getting online and watching new videos on, on how to do something, that's how you grow. You learn new skills and hobbies. When you group that all together, you can really put together something special. This is my first knife built specifically for myself and I'm really happy with how it's going so far. A lot of time, a lot of uh, development of skill and craft 
to get to this point to build something like this but you got to start somewhere so I really hope you guys actually do make that start as always thank you guys so much for watching you the audience are who we make this show for if you can support my sponsors who I'm so appreciative of you help carry this show along as always make sure you tune in next week to the Newfoundland Hobbyists